Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our listening session on policing reform. Before we get started, I'd like to run through a few housekeeping items so you all know how to participate in today's event. First, all lines are on mute. If you experience any technical difficulties at any point during our presentation, please explain your problem through the chat feature and we will try our best to address the issue. Lastly, we are recording this meeting and the video will be available on our YouTube page within 24 hours. Please subscribe to New Jersey OAG on YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and Flickr for the latest update on news, resources, and information from our office. And now I'd like to welcome our host and moderator, New Jersey Attorney General, Gribier Graywall. Do I have to accept it? Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's virtual conversation on policing reform. I'm New Jersey Attorney General Grabir Graywall, and I have the privilege of moderating today's session, which features two distinguished guests, Vanita Gupta and J. Scott Thompson. Although both are national leaders on today's topic, they come at it from very different backgrounds. Vanita, as the former head of the Department of Justice's Civil Rights Division and current CEO of the Leadership Conference on Civil and Human Rights, and Scott as a former Camden police chief who led that city's police department through dramatic reform. Today's program is part of our 21 county, 21st century policing project. 2121 is an initiative designed to build and to enhance police community trust through dialogue and engagement. And we haven't allowed COVID-19 to put a pause on these sessions because engagement at this particular moment the intersection of two pandemics, really, a global, a global health pandemic on the one hand and a national systemic racism pandemic on the other is more important and necessary now than ever before. So we've switched to this new virtual format and have had dozens of these 2121 virtual sessions over the last several months. And we'll continue in this way until we can safely gather in person again. Today, we're going to discuss how we can build and enhance trust between law enforcement and the communities they serve through meaningful and lasting policing reform. I'm excited to hear Vanita and Chief Thompson's thoughts because we're working hard here in New Jersey to build a national model of policing reform, whether it's through the Excellence in Policing Initiative, which we launched in December 2019, and through which we've implemented a number of innovative statewide policies intended to promote the culture of professionalism, transparency, and accountability that is the hallmark of New Jersey's best law enforcement agencies, or the additional actions we took recently to update New Jersey's use of force policy for all officers in our state for the first time in 20 years, or, to, or the policies that require our police departments to disclose information about cases of serious officer misconduct. These are important steps, and they're meaningful reforms. But we know that there's more that we can and that we must do. We need to do that to heal the rift in many communities between residents and their law enforcement officers. That's why we are also soliciting public input through listening sessions in all 21 counties and through our website. And that's also why we're having today's conversation. on these issues. So let's turn to our first guest, which is Vanita Gupta. Vanita is president and CEO of the Leadership Conference on Civil and Human Rights. Before joining the Leadership Conference in June 2017, she served as acting attorney general and head of the U.S. Department of Justice's Civil Rights Division. Appointed in October 2014 by President Barack Obama as the chief civil rights prosecutor for the United States, she oversaw a wide range of criminal, and civil enforcement efforts, efforts to ensure equal justice and to protect equal opportunity for all during one of the most consequential periods for the division. Under her leadership, the division did critical work in a number of areas, including advancing constitutional policing and criminal justice reform, prosecuting hate crimes and human trafficking, promoting disability rights, protecting the rights of LGBTQ individuals, ensuring voting rights, for all in combating discrimination in education, 
housing, employment, lending, and religious exercise. Prior to joining the Justice Department, she held leadership positions at the American Civil Liberties Union and at the NAACP Legal Defense and Education Fund. Benita graduated magna cum laude from Yale University and received her law degree from New York University School of Law. We'd like to welcome Benita to our conversation this afternoon. Hi. Good afternoon, General. Good afternoon, Vanita, and welcome. Thank you for joining us. Some of today's attendees may not be familiar with the work of the Leadership Conference on Human and Civil Rights. Can accept your webcam request. Sorry. Some of our attendees might may not be familiar with the work that you do at the Leadership Conference. Could you just give a brief overview of what your organization does? Sure. Um, first of all, thank you, General, for hosting this really important conversation. It's happening at an incredibly critical time for our country and for communities all over the country throughout. Um, the Leadership Conference was founded actually 70 years ago by Jewish and African American leaders who felt like the fight for civil rights couldn't be waged by one group alone, but really needed to be waged in coalition. And at that time, the galvanizing fight was around the fight for voting rights. But over the last 70 years, the Leadership Conference has been really the federal arm of the civil rights movement and increasingly helping to support state and local efforts for civil rights under the theory that what happens in the states is ultimately going to lay the groundwork for net nationwide change and protection of civil rights uh, around the country. And so today we do a lot of work on voting rights. We're fighting for a fair and accurate census, but also for policing and justice reform, which have been longstanding issues for the civil rights community. And when we talk about policing and justice reform, last month during uh, congressional testimony, uh, you shared eight recommendations that the Leadership Conference supported along with about 400 other civil rights organizations, uh, recommendations designed to enhance accountability and restore public trust in policing. Could you briefly share and outline some of those recommendations? Yeah, sure. So um, on June 1st, just days after George Floyd had been murdered in Minneapolis by uh, Derek Chauvin and a video that many have seen around the world, um, the Leadership Conference kind of galvanized a framework for, for Congress, understanding that uh, members of Congress were looking to legislation that would begin at least as a first step to address uh, the need for transformative police accountability uh, and police reform. And we, we are both a coalition of over uh, 220 organizations and a staff of over 100 and working on develop, kind of drawing from some of our own work in the last couple of years, we proposed a framework to that we had over 400 organizations co-sign, telling Congress that any legislation that they put forth should include these eight proposals. Uh, one is creating a national use of force standard. Um, it is incredible, but a lot of people think that this already exists, but actually there isn't. And it would be focused on making sure that uh, police departments use what only force that is necessary. And there's some definitions that we give to that. Another is the prohibition on racial profiling, which New Jersey in many ways has been at the vanguard of for, for a long time, but there actually isn't the kind of robust national protections that New Jersey has. Uh, and it would require also robust data collection, which as you know, General, has to accompany any robust effort on, on banning racial profiling. Third is banning the use of chokeholds, which is the maneuver that was used uh, by uh, Officer Draven uh, on uh, Mr. Floyd that day, but banning chokeholds and other maneuvers that cut off blood and oxygen. The fourth is, um, ending the militarization of policing and the transfer of military equipment to local police departments that can really result in escalation of police presence and police use of force in certain situations. The fifth was the prohibition of the use of no-knock warrants. This is the kind of warrant that was used uh, when police officers entered Breonna Taylor's home while she was asleep. Uh, as most of you know, Breonna Taylor was killed that night, but a prohibition on that. There have been several jurisdictions that have already taken that step, including Oregon and Florida, and now Louisville, Kentucky, after what happened to Ms. Taylor. 
Uh, the sixth was strengthening federal accountability systems. So you and I have both worked for the Department of Justice, um, but the, what few people understand is that the jurisdiction for the federal government to actually criminally prosecute police officers who uh, violate the law is very, very limited. And so this was an effort to expand federal prosecutorial jurisdiction to reach uh, police officer misconduct as the facts and the law may warrant. The seventh was to create a national police misconduct registry. Uh, in many instances um, where you end up with a prosecution in these kinds of cases, we find that officers had a longer history of disciplinary records um, and have kind of circulated from department to department. And those who have been hiring in departments don't have access to information about disciplinary records. So this would be to create a national registry. And then the last was to end qualified immunity, which is really an effort to increase accountability in the civil system um, for police officers who engage in misconduct. This framework, General, was reflected in the General, uh, the Justice and Policing Act, which uh, I testified both in the House of Representatives and then in the Senate in June in support of it is now passed the House of Representatives and awaits a hearing in the Senate. But that's just, that's the framework. It's a start, it's not the, the, the end, but these were some of the robust protections that, that the civil rights community had been seeking. You know, those are um, the, the framework that, that you lay out, the eight recommendations. I'm proud to say that, that we are uh, implementing a number of them, have implemented a number of them. You mentioned uh, the data collection, our history uh, with respect to racial profiling uh, in this state and the steps we've taken to combat it. Um, one of the things that I wanted to follow up on that you mentioned was uh, police licensing. Uh, mm -hmm. We in New Jersey are moving forward with police licensing. Uh, we already license uh, numerous other professionals, accountants, attorneys, doctors, teachers, uh, but police officers are not one of those professions. We're a handful of states, uh, among five states, I believe, uh, that don't license uh, law enforcement officers, but we're taking steps uh, to prevent what you described, an officer jumping from department to department. Uh, and we had one officer recently who went to nine departments uh, by the age of 32. Uh, and was able to, in some cases, run from, from their baggage. Uh, the, the National uh, Registry for Police Conduct would address this issue, uh, would address the issue if, if an officer went from one state to the other. Uh, but can you uh, tell us how, uh, how this would work or what your vision is for a national registry? Yeah, and I should say, Jared, and you may know this, but a number of law enforcement associations actually support the creation of this registry, in part because um, it, there are really severe consequences on departmental morale, on accountability systems when um, officers are able to cycle from department to department who have these long disciplinary records. It brings down officer morale across the board. It isn't good for the culture of a department that may be really seeking to aspire to, to incorporate and adopt and reflect best practices. And so this registry is something that would provide, it would require that there be due process to ensure that officers aren't misplaced on this registry. Of course, that is important, but it would allow for, um, as there exists in a lot of other professions, um, you know, the kind of uh, a recording and acknowledgement of officers that have um, serious offenses and disciplinary records um, and provide the resources for doing this. It would mandate that local agencies upload that information into the system. Um, and I think, you know, I talk about this a lot and your next guest, um, Chief Scott Thompson, talks about this a lot, but a lot of what you see in the police reform kind of conversation is you can adopt all of the best policies that you want in place. And then you can do training on them, which is obviously really important to changing culture. But without back-end accountability, nothing kind of changes. You And then culture eats policy for lunch. And um, the accountability comes in a lot of different forms. And one of them is through this National Police Misconduct Registry. It really is time uh, to kind of adopt some of these best practices that exist in other professions. Policing is a profession and uh, needs to be have those same standards. You know, uh, some of the policies uh, that you described, I'm sure they were informed by the work that you, you did when you were with the DOJ, with the Civil Rights Division. Um, and, and some of that investigative work that you did um, 
required work on the ground in cities like Ferguson and Baltimore uh, and, and a number of other cities uh, during your time with DOJ. Uh, when you spoke to residents about policing, which I know w was part uh, of your work there, to that robust community engagement that should inform our policies, uh, can you share with us, you know, what you learned when you spoke to residents, what kind of responses you got, and were they narrowly focused on, uh, on, on policing practices, or were they more broadly reflective of some of the societal problems that we're, we're dealing with still today and, and have been dealing with for some period of time? Yeah, I was really heartened to hear you at the top of this talk about how you're doing listening sessions and engagement in all of the counties in New Jersey. Um, I think, you know, this kind of community engagement shouldn't just happen in the aftermath of a crisis. Part of the effort to build trust between law enforcement and the communities they serve has to be an ongoing exercise, almost 365 days of the year. Uh, and there's been, uh, you know, a real sense in some communities that law enforcement isn't transparent that the policies and priorities are not accessible to the public, that the community doesn't have a way to actually engage and inform what those priorities should be, what public safety should look like. And uh, when we were, when I was at the Justice Department, uh, and we would often go into jurisdictions that were in crisis, that's just the reality of the Civil Rights Division's work. Obviously, there were other parts of the Justice Department that were providing technical assistance to police departments. But when we would go in, we would find that um, that sometimes it was the first time that community leaders were sitting down with their police leadership uh, in the aftermath of a crisis. Um, but the community engagement was really, really important. And in too many instances, the one place where I think, you know, protesters and police officers are actually quite aligned is the recognition that police officers are uh, have been tasked with kind of trying to solve for a lot of longtime disinvestment in communities, particularly communities of color, from uh, you know, healthcare and schools and jobs and that policing issues were really the tip of the spear. And that police officers are often the ones being called. There's only one kind of tool in a police department like the 911 phone number for when a family member is, has a, uh, is in crisis and mental health crisis and there isn't any kind of existing mental health services for this uh, person or for this family, um, and police officers are being called to become social workers and be the first go-to response. And in some communities, the only response because we have just criminalized and provided kind of a criminal justice model. And so in some of these consent decrees that the Justice Department um, went, you know, um, uh, went into in, with these cities, part of the solutions involved pairing up police officers with mental health professionals so that in certain, in certain calls, uh, police officers were not the only ones kind of arriving at the scene, but actually mental health professionals who may have been better trained to de-escalate, um, to, to provide medical aid, to, to figure out alternative resolutions. Same with homelessness, school discipline. We've had a country where for too long policymakers have probably have over relied on a criminalization and criminal justice uh, infrastructure. And this is where I think there's a lot of really important conversations happening around the country, General, about how is it, what have we prioritized in communities? Um, how can we better serve law enforcement and have communities actually define public safety as including access to health care, access to mental health services, access to alternatives for people who are experiencing homelessness uh, and the like? You know, uh, you touch on a number of, of really um, uh, significant uh, issues that we're contending with in this state. Obviously, um, it, this sort of feeds into the defunding uh, conversation that's going on. Uh, and we have folks um, who are calling for um, local governments to defund their police and to invest uh, in these other services uh, because, um, like you said, a mental health professional may be better situated to diffuse a crisis where somebody who might be going through a psychiatric episode, uh, you know, it, when they're interacting with a law enforcement officer alone, uh, that may not lead to um, a, a 
let's just say it, a nonviolent resolution in some cases, because sometimes law enforcement officers are not trained to defuse those situations. We're trying to address that by funding crisis intervention team training uh, across our state to have representative numbers of law enforcement officers across different departments trained with mental health professionals, trained uh, to, to, to know where, where they can get that additional resource, where they can get additional help, where they could uh, perhaps pass on somebody to the type of uh, help that they need. You know, the crisis intervention team model uh, is, is 20 law enforcement officers and 20 uh, social workers, mental health professionals. Part of it is for law enforcement to, to realize that somebody in a psychiatric episode may not be uh, ignoring their commands, but simply may not be able to process what's going on. Uh, and they might need a different uh, type of approach to diffuse that situation. And part of it is to develop those relationships uh, with the mental health professionals so they know who else to call and bring to and respond to a scene. So the challenge uh, when I hear defund the police uh, is I need more funding in this situation to address some of these issues, uh, more funding to invest in this type of training until all those other systems are built back up. So, you know, what is your thought when, when you hear this slogan of defund the police and how do you square it with, with what you just shared, the need to, to build up these other types of trainings to know uh, how to pass off somebody to that other treatment professional, uh, knowing that those systems are not perfect either? Yeah, no, look, it's a um, it's a really important question. And I think there's a lot of misconceptions about uh, what people or assumptions, I should say, about what people mean. I think, it, um, so first of all, there isn't a single definition, but I think yep. my understanding of it is that the underlying um, concerns that are being raised is really about the systemic disinvestment from uh, black communities in particular but uh, low-income communities, black and brown communities of positive investments and supports like healthcare, access to mental health services, um, the kinds of things that, that people in higher income communities, they can go to the police for very serious offenses and then have a lot of other resources to turn to for, um, for, other, you know, for other social problems that can arise. Um, and that there's a demand right now for local elected officials to look at their budgets as moral documents and that define and describe priorities and, um, and the value of, of human lives and not using a kind of exclusively a criminal justice approach or a criminal legal infrastructure approach and to say, look, we have to look at the ways in which these budgets are allocated. Um, and so I think it is an important conversation to have. I think there's little question that in many instances, when you are trying to create, for instance, um, you know, the kind of CIT, the crisis intervention training that you're talking about, General, and you're trying to bring in mental health professionals into um, into this kind of approach, it actually does require resources. It's a new model. It's a new paradigm. The question is, can we, as uh, you know, as people who have been um, occupying these positions, but also can policymakers that control budgets at the local level actually also develop a plan around how to do these positive investments and show that public safety should not just be uniquely defined by police officers and jails and prisons, but by these other systems. It's a longer term conversation that we're not gonna resolve today. We're not gonna even right. resolve it. 2020 or 2021, it is going to involve the kind of work you're doing and that your departments are doing in partnership with mental health services or with schools around the country uh, or in the state. Um, but I think there, it is asking a more fundamental question about how are we prioritizing and resourcing the ways in which we create and define who's at the table for helping to define public safety in their communities. Yeah, and I think the, the, the community involvement and engagement certainly has to be a part of it. It is, it is an approach that we are taking, as you acknowledged, um, because, you know, we govern by the consent of the people, and I think we need to start policing by the consent of the people. And as we're having these community conversations, um, we are learning about so many different gaps uh, that yeah. we're seeing in different communities. And we're, 
learning and, and it's informing our policies. You know, we, we instituted hospital-based hospital uh, violence uh, interruption programs and, and community-based violence interruption programs because we saw in some of our major cities uh, that the recidivism rates for gunshot victims and, and things of that nature were so high. And so rather than dealing with the problem on the back end, is there a way to, to deal with it on the front end and, and to address some of the root causes? And again, that is because we are in the community, listening to the community where the needs are, uh, the needs for, you know, additional recreational opportunities. You know, we've, we went into Atlantic City uh, with a, a different approach to, to start now investing in, in, in more of the educational and, and, and recreational after school opportunities that, that have not received the funding uh, that they typically receive, but it is law enforcement uh, doing that with with the funds that we have. So it just highlights how how this rebalance um, has to happen. But the challenge uh, is that it, the defunding and immediately withdrawing these types of resources from law enforcement puts them in an untenable position. Uh, yeah. And that's a balance we're not going to resolve today in this conversation. Uh, it is certainly an ongoing conversation. And I know uh, you know, Chief Thompson has his views on on it as well, because they ended up increasing the size uh, of the Camden uh, Metro Police Department uh, after uh, after the Camden uh, City Police Department was was uh, eliminated. Um, General, can I just I, add I wanna... something just sure. about that, which is because um, I didn't fully answer your question when I was saying that, you know, when the Justice Department, I remember going to a community meeting in Baltimore when we were talking about launching the investigation into the Baltimore Police Department. And oftentimes when I would stand in front of these rooms uh, communi with, with community members, they would say, yeah, yeah, we've got a huge problem with police community trust or, um, you know, with policing issues, but our schools are broken, our roads aren't fixed, we don't have access yeah. to public transportation. And they wanted the Justice Department to come in and fix all of that. And in some ways they were really prescient because a lot of folks in communities are like, yeah, the policing issues really are more of a kind of top line symptom of some deeper issues that may be existing in our communities. So I do think just to your point that a lot of this conversation right now is trying to understand the different kind of components in communities that have a responsibility. It's all been laid at the feet of police, uh, of, of the police because of, you know, our state legislatures have a huge role to play in what they have criminalized, and there's been a systematic kind of increase in what has been criminalized over the last few decades. I think New Jersey, in some ways, has really been a model of trying to push and investigate some decriminalization of low-level offenses, things that really um, have resulted in much greater contact between law enforcement and certain communities in a way that hasn't been kind of core to public safety. So I just wanted to underscore that it's there's a lot of responsibility that it needs to be borne even outside of just policing and law enforcement for kind of the, the, the systems that we have today. And I think that's in part what people, what activists are asking for um, when they are talking about these issues right now in the aftermath of George Floyd's uh, uh, murder. Uh, absolutely. And, and um... I, I want to move on to a couple of other points, and I know we're, we're uh, limited on time today, um, but I want to go back to your work at DOJ. Um, some uh, folks have been critical of the work that was done during the Obama administration, saying that it was too aggressive of an approach uh, when it comes to policing and accountability and oversight, that the consent decrees went too far. Uh, but on the other hand, um, the current approach is completely different. It, it is, you know, we went from 25 or half a dozen different consent decrees uh, to virtually none. I mean, you know, Attorney General Sessions, I remember, uh, said that this wasn't going to be a tool to be, to to be uh, that they were going to to use in their toolbox to to have oversight over law enforcement. Um, you know, how, how did your approach differ uh, uh, with respect to uh, as compared to the current DOJ approach? Yeah. So, um, you know, we're a nation of over 18,000 police departments and sheriff's, uh, sheriff's departments, and the Obama Justice Department conducted 25 investigations, and by the time that I stepped down in January of 2017, had 14 consent decrees. In the scheme of things, uh, it's not much. Uh, uh, the work was high profile, certainly. Consent decrees um, were looked at by police departments around the country uh, oftentimes, I remember going to meetings with 
police chiefs and they would talk about how they would have their uh, their departments and their command staff look and read consent decrees, read the Ferguson report um, to really kind of think about what more could they do. They became models for, for best practices and cutting edge practices. Uh, unfortunately, uh, this Justice Department and this administration has really halted these efforts. Uh, they cannot stop existing consent decrees, consent decrees that were filed with Article III federal judges in January 2017. It's one of the beauties of consent decrees is they are impervious to political change. They really exist with federal judges who can then determine uh, compliance um, uh, over time. But this work has stopped. And you know, I think it's important to remember that Congress gave the Justice Department the mandate to investigate systemic practices and patterns of misconduct after, in 1994, after uh, Rodney King was beaten by the LAPD yeah, right. and the arrest that followed. And so to walk away from this is actually walking away from a core law enforcement function that, that the Justice Department is meant to provide. But I will also say, and this is a perfect segue to your next guest who I uh, hold in great reverence and has been a really good friend and partner in this work with, with me and was in with the Justice Department before. But um, the kind of, the fulcrum or the focus of leadership um, in the last few years has really been with people like you, General, state attorneys, generals, who have understood how crucial it is to be able to ensure that police officers and police departments have legitimacy in the communities, that that is essential to trust, and that without trust, you can't actually do public safety. Crime victims aren't going to report. You're not going to have witnesses sharing information. Um, and that State AGs, uh, I would say mayors have played a really important role. Progressive police chiefs have played an important role. And a year and a half ago, the leadership conference, kind of in recognition of the void of support from the federal government, aggregated all of the DOJ consent decrees, um, research from the International Association of Chiefs of Police. Uh, Chief Thompson helped review this. We had civil rights organizations inform it. And we launched this thing called the New Era of Public Safety that we'll hopefully share with um, with those who are listening, that aggregates all of these best practices, lifts up police departments that have innovated um, to be a resource and, and did a toolkit for community advocates to understand how they can push for change with their police department, with other local officials. And it's something that we needed to do because it's really important to understand that so much of these issues is really fundamentally local and local advocacy, local activism, local leadership um, is really crucial um, now more than ever. I, I couldn't, I couldn't agree with you more. Not, not because we're, we're doing the work, but I, I, but I, because the DOJ now is not doing that work. And, uh, you know, we are certainly happy to fill that gap and, and to, to build that legitimacy, to build that trust, which underpins everything we do, which improves public safety, which improves policing, which is better for law enforcement uh, in the long run. Uh, and but we have to get back to that DOJ model, because I think if you look at the Ferguson report, so many of the issues that, that were highlighted then, so many of the solutions that were highlighted then are the, are the issues and solutions that we need right now. Uh, yeah. and, and, you know, I. You, you say in your Washington uh, Post opinion piece that uh, there is no returning to normal right now. Uh, we have to create a new way forward. Why is this particular moment, this will be my last question, different than 2013, different than post-Ferguson, where we saw in your report that that a local government that, that disregarded its citizens and saw them as sources of revenue rather than people, well, that created a rift, a chasm, and, and, and there were solutions that were offered, uh, but here we are all these years later, uh, really in the same place. Why is this particular moment different? So, you know, um, I think for a number of reasons. So first of all, I think it was really significant that law enforcement swiftly condemned George Floyd's murder in the way that they did. I view that as progress, to be honest with you, because I think that that reflects culture shift and change in understanding the importance of why law enforcement needs to speak out when these kinds of things happen. I also think the escalation, and you'll remember this, General, that, you know, in 2013, uh, before Michael Brown was killed, um, people, I mean, de-escalation was a concept, but it was not nearly as widely adopted by police departments around, around the country. What I think is different today, um, so there's been baby steps, there's been progress. Has it been enough? Absolutely not. 
Um, but the difference right now is that George Floyd was murdered against a backdrop of a global pandemic, COVID-19, which is afflicting all of us, all of our families, our communities, our whole country and world. And it is also revealing gross structural inequalities in healthcare, healthcare outcomes, black and brown communities, black and Latino communities in particular, really disproportionately being infected and dying from COVID-19 uh, because of a whole range of different issues. Uh, it's also uh, happening in, against an upcoming election where um, you've got a pretty stark contrast and not being political here, but I think that there's a lot of feeling in this country that we may be determining this year, you know, the fate of what this country is going to look like. And so all of this is brewing together. And I think the sustained protests in the street um, kind of proclaiming Black Lives Matter and, and wanting to stand up for an America as good as its ideals is, um, is something that feels uniquely different. I was out at a protest in June in Washington, DC. It was huge and different. It was multiracial. It was multi-generational. And there's this real sense. It actually gave me a hopefulness, ironically, that in the in spite of the crises that we find ourselves in, people understand what's at stake and they are wanting to, they feel invested in the American project, which has always required, you know, people of good conscience rolling up their sleeves and doing the hard work to perfect this union. Right. And I think that's where we are today. And I think policing issues are a crucible of this, but these these issues around race, systemic racism, racial injustice are kind of percolating in corporate America, in NASCAR, and you're seeing it in all kind of um, aspects of life. And I think this is why we're at a unique moment in our nation's history right now. And, and it's a moment we have to seize. And I thank you for your time and your leadership on these issues. And, and I'm confident because there are good people who are answering the call, who are not going to let this moment pass, that that this will, uh, there, there won't be a return to normal, uh, thankfully. So th thank you for everything you do. Thank you for your time. And uh, hopefully we'll continue the conversation in the near future. Sounds great. Thank you, General. Thank you Excellent. for your leadership. Why don't, can you put me on mute for a second? We back on. All right. Uh, thank you for uh, that indulgence. There, we we're just fixing some technical issues. Uh, now it's my pleasure to start our conversation with Scott Thompson. Scott is Holtec's executive director of global security, and prior to moving to the private sector, Scott had a distinguished record of public service with more than 27 years of law enforcement experience. Most recently, for 11 years as the chief of police for the Camden County Police Department, where he oversaw a police department of more than 600 sworn and civilian employees. In 2013, then Chief Thompson pioneered an innovative strategy that significantly transformed the public safety profile of the city of Camden, New Jersey, a city that was perennially labeled as the nation's most dangerous city. He created a new police department, really a reimagined police department that was responsible for achieving unprecedented reductions in crime, culminating in a 50-year low in 2018. To achieve this, Chief Thompson developed unique strategies, harnessed technologies, and bolstered an organizational culture that led the President of the United States at the time, Barack Obama, in 2015 to recognize his department as a model of 21st century policing. Scott holds an MA in education from Seton Hall University and a BA in sociology from Rutgers University. Scott, welcome. Thank you, General. Thank you for having me here today. I'm delighted to be here with you uh, to continue a conversation that you and I regularly have 
uh, about policing, about how we can move things forward, how we can continue to build trust uh, between law enforcement and community. But before I get into some of the substance uh, that, that I want to talk about with you, can you just briefly share your path to the leadership of the Camden City Police Department? Sure. You know, my, my pathway there was, uh, was a rather unique one, General. Um, things were, were so bad in the city of Camden that if you remember back in 2003, uh, then Governor Corzine had superseded control of the entire city under the Municipal Economic Rehabilitation Act. Um, all there was a, a, a COO was appointed and all the elected leaders virtually had, had no real authority. Um, the, the police department had had five leaders in five years over, over a period of time from 2003 to 2008. Uh, we were uh, parentally labeled as dysfunctional, apathetic, uh, lethargic, um, mismanaged. And in 2007, the New Jersey Attorney General Ann Milgram had actually superseded control of the organization. Um, I was appointed to police chief in, in basically one day. Uh, it was not ceremonial. Uh, to be quite frank with you, I don't think I was the best person for the job, General. I think it was a lack of options. And, uh, and I was thrusted into a position. Um, at the point in time in 2008, it was in the end of July, it was this time, uh, 2008. We were on record pace to, um, for murders that year. Uh, crime was, was uh, not as high. It was, um, it was extraordinarily um, um, egregious. You know, we had had, we were getting, the amount of children that were being shot and killed in broad daylight um, in fact, my first week as a police chief, it was a pretty memorable moment for me, was as my son was five at the time, uh, a four-year-old little boy was murdered um, and caught in a crossfire in broad daylight. But that's how I became police chief. I was, uh, it was a baptism by fire. Uh, it was an organization that, um, that uh, change was needed. And we were, we were really rooted in the status quo. And uh, effectuating change at that period in time was, was extremely difficult. Um, but that was the beginning of my journey as a police chief. And, and change happened, uh, Scott, and, and change happened uh, with events leading to the abolition of the Camden uh, City Police Department and replacing it uh, with the Camden County Metro Police Department. Um, you know, arguably replacing the police department with the county model wasn't the only solution, but can, can you talk about uh, the events that led to the abolition of the department? Well, in 2011, we, uh, you know, the economic downturn of 2008 uh, came home to roost in Camden in, in 2011. In January of 2011, we laid off 46% of the organization in one day. It was 168 cops were laid off. Everybody with 14 years or less was gone. Um, in 2000, and so we essentially went from a, a department of, and just to, to, to correct your earlier number, General, we're about 600 total, not 600 sworn. Uh, Camden is authorized to about 400, but usually operates about 350. Um, right. At the time, we were around 368, and we went down to 200 officers. And what we saw, which is which is an interesting perspective from a lot of the dialogue with defunding the police. So in a place like Camden, when our staffing levels dropped to uh, 1920 staffing levels, um, we saw we went from being the nation's most dangerous city. To, to getting even worse. Uh, the New York Times had featured an article and I think the total of it was, it was just that. It went from bad to worse. Um, and we saw our violent crime rate exceed that of, of, uh, of really third world countries, to be quite frank with you. Um, and then when, when um, a decision was made and for moving forward, and it was a political decision, was were they going to re, you know, re-resource the city police department or start over. And um, the political decision was made to start over. And from Governor Christie to uh, County Freeholder uh, Leader uh, Luke DiPelli to Mayor Dana Red, um, everybody put an oar in, in the water and started to row in the same direction. Uh, and it was unprecedented in New Jersey. It was unprecedented in the United States to, to, to do something like that, particularly in as large and as challenged of, of a place as Camden. Um, but what we essentially did was everybody was, was, was fired, including myself. I had been a cop for 20 years and been a police chief for five. Um, and I had to fill out a 50-page application. Um, everyone did. Uh, 
retake a psychological, retake a medical, uh, pass an interview. And I was a probationary employee for, for the first year. Um, and, but what that gave us the, the very rare opportunity to do was we had the opportunity to build culture rather than try to change it. Um, and people who, um, who had endured uh, a pretty tough paper route up until then um, came over into the county police force and the vision was, was clear. It was we were going to be guardians and not warriors. We were not going to take the same failed approaches that had led us to have virtually no gain in the previous three to four decades before. Um, we needed to change the dynamic of violent crime and the relationship that we had with the community. Um, we had made a lot of mistakes and, and the, the levels of mistrust between the residents and the police were extremely high. And if you know the history of Camden in the 60s and 70s, we had race riots that were predicated by police violence. So there were, there, from, from the day I came on the police department, um, there were very high levels of mistrust between the community and its police. And you know, we took the burden upon ourselves in 2013 to say, we're going to reach out, we're going to continue to reach out, we're going to understand why we're being rejected by the public, but we're not going to allow that to, to deter us. We're going to reinvent ourselves, and we're going to do so in a way in which we put more focus on on being coalescers and conveners and getting people to reclaim public space than we are by, by, by just arbitrarily and capriciously enforcing the law. Because that, that invariably, what that does is that, that militarizes neighborhoods and it polarizes communities. And then you get a flashpoint incident and the things blow over. You, you, you know, Scott, the, the experience that you've had uh, in Camden uh, and what you just laid out, I think, highlights a number of things. And it goes back uh, to some of the things that Vanita was talking about, which is the need for trust to underpin everything that we do, for the legitimacy, for people to come forward, report crimes, for, for them to share information with law enforcement. All of that leads to better public safety, leads to law enforcement safety. But there's not uh, just a, a, it's not one silver bullet here. There, there's a number of things that need to be done. And I think, you know, you highlighted, you know, changing mentality, right? To, to be that guardian and not that warrior. Uh, but some of that starts with hiring and you were able to, to start from the ground up and rehire uh, the, the, the types of people you wanted to be policing uh, the community. And then, and then some of it is training. And then, then some of it is uh, oversight, the type of oversight that you uh, implemented uh, to, to look at uh, officers who were, were ticketing at a higher rate. When you're ticketing and issuing a $250 ticket where the average median income is, what, $13,000 or $14,000, that's life-changing. And to sort of rethink the way in which you're policing. But so much of that w goes to what you were saying. You were also listening to the community, that you were engaging. And I think those are all important lessons that we need to take to heart, you know, that chiefs need to start implementing. We, we need to start listening. We need to listen to community members. We need to acknowledge that there are chasms between law enforcement and community. And then we see, start to, to, to build bridges over those chasms, bring people together. You know, it's not about just rebuilding trust because in some places there's no trust to begin with. So you, you gotta create the trust. Um, one of the ways that I think you did that was in rewriting your use of force policy, uh, and, and that that was critical. I think. Uh, could, could you could you tell us what you were thinking when when you undertook that process, uh, and highlight some of the changes in your use of force policy? Yeah, sure. So, in when I started to engage the community and and others too, so it, it was you know I started to have high levels of communication with. Um, people in research, academia, across the country, the ACLU, uh, the community. And it better informed me in virtually all the, the strategies and tactics that we were taking at the time. You know, we were still making mistakes even when we launched as a county police force. We still had high levels of low-level enforcement. And it was really a conversation I had with Alex Shalom at the, at the New Jersey ACLU who challenged me on it. He came to me and showed me statistics that I wasn't even aware of. And I said, you know, I, I, I hear you. And then I heard my community and uh, we started to go in a different direction. So I was already uh, reaping the benefits, if you will, of allowing myself to be educated and be informed by people other than just my colleagues 
because sometimes, and let's be frank, that can be an echo chamber, right? We all come up in the same organization, we all come up in the same culture, and there's silos in which we exist. And where we made the greatest gains in Camden were, were not the uh, uh, strategies or tactics that we unilaterally created. There were, one, there were ones in which we collaborated with the people. And so when it came time for, for use of force, we looked at it in a way in which traditionally police departments will not allow the community or outsiders to have a say. Now, I'm not saying that you sit down with um, a civilian and say, what type of, of, of strategy or tactic should be used in this type of situation, uh, but to have them have uh, input in the, in the overarching principles of the, the, the policy, to be able to listen to their concerns when they want to see something different, and you can articulate back to them the, your concerns. You're now, you know, you're going through a process that's that's showing mutual level. There's mutual levels of respect that are going back and forth. So we did this. We brought in uh, NYU Policing Project, um, and they helped us do this project. We we brought in the uh, our, our local fraternal order of police, the community, the ACLU, um, and we did polls that that actually went outside of Camden as well, and. Look, we developed a policy that essentially got co-signed by, by all, all parties that were involved. Now, was it the policy that we as police initially started with? No, it didn't. Um, was it the policy that uh, any one of the entities that we were dealing with wanted us to implement? No, it wasn't, but, but there was compromise in that process. And we walked out of it treating each other with respect and dignity. And you know, what you start to see now, General, and you and I have talked about this so many times, and, and, and your leadership is, is right on point with this, is the time, that you, um, the time that you need friends, that's not the time to try to make friends, right? And <clears throat> knowing that use of force is, is probably, not even probably, is, is the most critical uh, policy that governs our behavior of how we use force upon our citizenry uh, that's something that that we cannot take lightly, and it's something that if we have the the voice and people and, and that are going to be uh, the recipients or the partners of us with with all of this, if they can see themselves in it, it certainly makes for much more tenable situations um, for when and not if that that situation occurs where you know the, the force that's being used is going to be called into question. Yeah, you know, I, that that is just so perfectly, so perfectly captures uh, what needs to be done moving forward. What we're trying to do, uh, the the process you implemented there with with how you wrote, rewrote your use of force policy is the process that we are now uh, taking statewide as we take this opportunity, this moment in which we find ourselves as an opportunity to to take some of the principles that you've incorporated in in your current policy and implement them uh, more broadly, but. I do have to say that, and I go back to a statement that you made uh, in your your New York Times Magazine uh, interview uh, with with Vanita and others, and Vanita referenced it in in her uh, in her comments earlier that uh, within a police department, culture eats policy for breakfast. You said, and you said that, you know, you can have a perfectly worded policy. You could have a perfectly worded. Uh, cutting edge, progressive use of force policy that hits on everything that you talked about, but it's meaningless if it just exists on paper. So what do we do? What do we do in Camden? What do we do in Trenton? What do we do across this state to ensure that this policy that we produce uh, at the end of this process in New Jersey uh, is more than just perfectly worded, uh, that it's more than just a, a perfectly worded document that sits there? How can we make sure uh, that it's meaningful? Well, I, I think a couple things. One, I think that you're you're absolutely correct, right? There has to be systems of control to ensure accountability that are in place. I think first and foremost, when 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 we did our significant shift in, in policy with use of force, we did uh, extremely heavy levels of um, of enforcement, not enforcement, investment into into the training of officers. So we just didn't craft the policy put it together and then hold everybody to account for it without really walking them through the motions. And that type of training, we did reality-based training. We went and we, we, we sent uh, officers uh, all across the country to learn 
the best ways to, to, to implement this. And what we find is generally our most tactical individuals, um, our SWAT team folks and the like, most of these principles are things that they practice on a routine basis and they're, and they're very well trained at, but we don't, we don't give that let's see, level of training to the frontline officers. So we knew that we had to invest in officers and we had to invest in officers in a way in which it wasn't just a check the box PowerPoint presentation, uh, log into the DMS, you know, here's the answers to the test and you're done. Um, it was putting people through it, uh, introducing artificial stress so that they could successfully navigate those waters. So after the, the training, it was then we put systems of, uh, of control in place, our levels of accountability. Now I'll tell you that Chief Waisaki and his team, uh, since I have left, <clears throat> have really taken this to a whole nother level. Um, he has developed a, 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 a the, the way to review the um, the uses of force. So every time in Camden now, every time force is used, um, there are, before the end of the shift, there's two levels of review. There's a sergeant and there's a watch commander that have to sign off on. Then literally within 24 to 48 hours, you're going to have internal affairs and you're going to have a training officer that's going to look at it. So not only are they looking at the lawfulness of the force that's being used, but they're looking at it from a training perspective. Could they have done things differently? Now you can remember our policy mandates um, the requirement of de-escalation. So we just don't look to see that when the cops punch somebody, were they justified in doing so? Did, did the, was the officer aggravating the situation? Did the officer de-escalate? Um, but we've, uh, and we, we utilize the body-worn camera as teaching moments. And so this has been structured more for enhancement as opposed to a gotcha. Um, and what we find is that this system is protecting people from themselves. Officers that, that tend to be heavy-handed officers that tend to be reactionary, it's being brought to their attention and we're able to help them to um, handle situations better so that they're not the next viral video, so they're not unemployed. And it's really, it's, it's, it's been a win-win. We've, we've, we've reduced our excessive force complaints 95% over, over, the, over the, uh, the course of the five years. Uh, two, uh, two points there, Scott. Um, one, I mean, the, what you described, when you 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 hire professional officers, you train them well, you have accountability measures, oversight, uh, all that's done, that starts to change culture so that policy takes hold. You mentioned viral video, and I and I think one of the ways uh, and a testament to how you've changed culture is the viral video we saw uh, in, on a Camden Street. And I don't remember all the details, but I remember when I saw it, I said, "Man, you know, I know cops don't have a duty to retreat." But in this case, they gave this this individual space, and, and, and they went between cars, and they you know created a safe zone to de-escalate the situation. It took a while, but in the end, that person got the help that they needed, and, and a situation where force probably could have been used earlier was not used. Uh, and when I say could have been, would have been legally justified, wasn't used. And that that viral video spoke, I think, volumes to how you changed culture. Can you speak about that incident for a moment? Sure. You know, and th that incident is, and in, in, in officers find this routinely, it's, um, it's, it's one in which uh, it would, gets called lawful but awful, right? It would have been, we, we had a mentally ill individual armed with a, with a very large knife. He, he was shown the capabilities. He had the means. He had the proximity. He was threatening people with it. He was slashing at officers. Um, but officers, by, by the training that we invested in them, we, we told them, that it's okay to reposition. In fact, we want you to reposition. Uh, it's safer for you. It's safer for the public. Now, there are times that that is not going to be the case. There are going to be times when you have to make that split second decision. And this is where training comes in. This is when we can train officers so that the situation, even for them, slows down and they can process things and they can, they can maximize time and distance and cover. And so when we had that incident, and one thing I thought was really telling about that incident in general was when you look at that video, um, there were officers on that scene that had three weeks on the job and 30 years on the job. And they all were in same lockstep. Nobody was shooting that guy. Uh, and I'm telling you, six months prior to that, we probably would have because that was, that was what our traditional training was, was we didn't have to reposition. And we didn't train officers on how to reposition. So the moment that they stood their ground and, and they, they, they drew down on him and he advanced, um, 
they probably would have just shot him and killed him. And it would have been a lawful but awful situation. There was, there was no reason that we had to take his life. And so instead we enveloped him. Uh, officers walked five city blocks with him. And then at one point in time when he was swinging the knife, as the knife fell out of his hand and, and the officers uh, were able to rush in and tackle him. Uh, and, you know, it, not only did, did, did officers not have to go through the traumatic experience of taking somebody's life, but I can also tell you that that signal to our community, the seriousness of our commitment to the sanctity of human life, which is the core principle of, of our use of force policy. And, and the other thing you've trained on, uh, and I've heard you speak on, uh, and, and you mentioned it right there, that repositioning is not the same as retreating. Uh, and you've also talked about if there's an unfortunate incident where an officer does have to use force and, and there's an injury, scoop and go. You, you take the person immediately to the hospital because the images that we saw in, in, in Ferguson, uh, the images that we've seen across the country, they have that, they, ha they undermine trust. Even if it was a lawful exercise of force, uh, you, you've trained uh, your officers to take the person immediately when force is used uh, to the hospital. And I think that that, that uh, also, I think, speaks to how culture is changing uh, in some ways. I, I want to just ta uh, end on um, two, two topics. Um, you know, I asked Vanita this question uh, lately. Obviously, there, there's been calls to defund the police. Uh, opponents like me uh, think that the debate should be about smarter funding, not defunding. Uh, and having uh, such a long law enforcement executive career as, as you've had, uh, what's your take on that? And, and could you provide uh, some thoughts as, as to, you know, what we should be doing when it comes to funding? Yeah, I, I, look, I, I, I believe, General, that cops count and police matter. Um, I, I have seen, so in, in my experiences in Camden, I, we essentially had a defunding in 2011 when we lost 46% of the organization and, and we saw um, how untenable that situation became, particularly from a public safety perspective and an officer safety perspective. Um, what, I, what I learned in, in, in my communication with the community as we were able to start to build a relationship and start to listen more was that the high levels of mistrust that people had for us, it wasn't that they wanted us to go away because we were still the agency of first resort. We were still being called constantly into communities that had very high levels of, of, of mistrust for us and even antipathy in, in many regards. <clears throat> so they didn't want us to go away. They just wanted us to behave differently. Um, so one, I think that it's important to understand that uh, unfortunately, in the national narrative, the people who fall victim to police violence the most are also the people that rely upon the police the most. And that, um, you know, one of the main calls for service in the city of Camden is domestic violence. And if, if the Camden police aren't going, then who is, yeah. right? And somebody's calling for help. Um, so when you start to look at the defunding issue, I, I think that there is there's some validity to the thought of um, people that, uh, and, and I don't think police disagree, that police should not have had mental illness, homeless, or addiction delegated to them over the, over the last few decades. And when you put very young people who are altruistic in their intentions, and you give them a gun, a ticket book, and a pair of handcuffs to tell them and ask them to go solve extremely complex problems that people with PhDs haven't even been able to resolve. You know, you start, you start to get into Maslow's law of instruments, right? Whereas if all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. And, yeah. and then we wonder why that movie has a bad ending time and time and time again. And I also don't think that there's a, a progressive police chief out there that wouldn't treat 10 cops or another boys and girls club in their community to be able to address the root cause issues that are that create the symptoms of crime. But until we get to that point where there is going to be a qualified and trained and prepared entity that's going to be there three o'clock in the morning to, to answer the uh, that woman's call for help because of an abusive spouse or the uh, uh, a neighbor that has somebody naked running up and down the street banging on their front door, um, until we get to that point in time, I think it's a major mistake to yep. pull the important resources away from the police. Um, because, and as you know, General, that 
you know, it's, it's like 94% of our budgets, of police budgets, are salary and wages. There's very little to go to training. And that training, that money has been called out over time. And, you know, to, to talk about removing more money from that and, 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 and divesting more in police, that's not going to make the current situation better. You know, if you if you ask the Scott Thompson who who entered the police academy 27 years ago or 28 years ago when you, when you entered the academy, uh, if if he was signing up for a career where he would be part marriage counselor, part uh, drug counselor, part mental health uh, expert, uh, part you know uh, expert in adverse childhood experiences uh, and dealing with trauma that young people might be carrying with them, I, I don't think. Correct me if I'm wrong. You would have ever said this is what I'm signing up for when I'm becoming a law enforcement officer. But I think what this moment, which we're finding ourselves now and, and living through, has has sort of shown is that every other system, you know, whether it's healthcare, housing, the mental health system, the addiction treatment system, is broken in some in some major way. That systemic injustices pervade other other institutions and, and, and other aspects of society. And, and what's happening is the, the end result is law enforcement is being asked to deal with a lot of this. And I think what you just perfectly uh, explained uh, is that we need to better fund and better train our cops to address these issues until all of those other systems are corrected. Because again, I don't think law enforcement officers I mean, everyone would agree, don't want to be the people responding to the mental health crisis, but they are the only ones who are called out there in that moment. And until we fix the other systems, we need to invest in those types of trainings that you've done in your department. We need to invest in the type of hiring we need to do and need to address address all of these issues because it really is the cops who are there doing all of this when everything else has broken. You know, so I'll give you a final thought, Scott, to wrap it up. Uh, I'm sorry we've gone a little bit over. I apologize for the technical difficulties we've had uh, throughout the call. But, uh, Scott, any final thoughts? You know, I, I uh, what I would implore um, policing, consistent with um, uh, Michael Brown back in, in Ferguson in, in 2015, is that change is going to occur. And we can either be the co-authors of that change or we can be the subject to it. But it, it's going to move in a direction. And that if, it, it, I, I just think that it's in best, everybody's best, best interest, and it's in officer safety's best interest for us to have high levels of communication with the community and to and to allow them to have a hand on the steering wheel for what law enforcement is gonna look like as we move to the future. Well, thank you, Scott, for, for having this much needed conversation. Thank you for your leadership. Thank you for your vision. Uh, thank you for all that you've done uh, in Camden and continue to do when it comes to addressing these issues in policing. Uh, we need to acknowledge that that change is required. We need to listen uh, and we need to uh, move forward together in a collaborative way, law enforcement and community, uh, to finally address these issues and, and not return to normal, as Vanita said uh, in her words. And I want to thank her also for her time uh, and her insights. And uh, as we close today's session, I wanted to remind everyone, once again, uh, we talked about it during our conversation with Scott, uh, that we are in the process of updating our state's use of force policy for the first time in 20 years. The use of force policy, as the chief just mentioned, affects everyone. And so everyone should have the opportunity to weigh in on its revisions. So I invite you to visit our public comment portal available at nj.gov slash OAG slash force to submit comments. Uh, submit comments regarding your experiences with the use of force. Submit comments uh, on what you think uh, we should be looking at as we undertake uh, this, this historic uh, revision process uh, and, and move forward with the national, what we think will be a national model uh, here in New Jersey. So comments will be accepted through August 1st uh, of this year. Uh, to aid members of the community uh, in understanding our current use of force policy, we held a, a background session on use of force with uh, John Parham, former chief of the Linden Police Department, now with the Union County Prosecutor's Office, Giles Shipp, uh, who is the head of Noble in New Jersey, uh, former uh, director of police in Plainfield, former Edison Police Department uh, officer, 
uh, and Covella Spruill, who is uh, the director now in Franklin Township and former chief of detectives uh, at the Essex County Prosecutor's Office. Uh, we're going to continue that conversation with another session on July 28th at noon. So look out for the registration information there. Uh, it'll be on our social media channels. Uh, and again, uh, we, we welcome the input. We think Jersey can be a model in this space. Uh, and we're not going to return to normal in this state. We're going to really push forward here uh, and, and bridge those divides where they may exist, uh, strengthen that trust between law enforcement and community, uh, and improve public safety and law enforcement safety as a result. So thank you for joining us today. Uh, please stay safe.